right, well, good morning, church. It's good to have you with us this morning. We're so glad you're here joining us. Why don't we go ahead and stand together as we worship? Can you put your hands together with us? Sing with these faithfuls, come on. sound coming on the wind changing hearts and minds healing brokenness I feel a generation breaking through despair I hear a generation full of faith song it will be out of the darkness we say out of the darkness we This morning. I mean, you guys can be seated. All right. Good morning, Trinity, family, and friends. How are y'all? Good. My name is Stacy St. Cyr. I work on staff here at Trinity. Some of you may know me. First of all, I wanted to say welcome to anyone who is visiting us for the first time. I promise not to make you. Oh, look, we got some hands in the back. 
So if you don't mind, we would love to see you at our welcome desk when you're leaving. We have a little gift for you. It's a nice little sussy. So make sure you stop by. I know I said sussy. So make sure you stop by and say hello. I have some announcements for you guys. If you want to look at the back of your bulletin, it's a lot. I'm just going to hit on the highlights. First of all, amen. You no longer need to register for Kids Connection in the back. We'll uh, amen. We will only have a 1045 service there for now, but you don't need to register. And we also have a new check-in process through the app. Super cool. We're finally with the times. So much easier. You're going to love it. Also, VBS opens today for Trinity family members. So go ahead, register today. We open to the general public tomorrow, so you want to make sure that you get your, your spots before that. Uh, men, we have a wings night this Friday in the student center. Good times, yes. Good times. That's so, to me, pre-COVID, eating with your fingers and being close quarters. I love it. And women, we have added a Thursday morning Bible study. It's the same one that we're having on Wednesday, but it's going to be offered Thursday morning. So you can go to our website, trinitybible.org, or through the app to see all of this and to register for all of these things. Um, we also have a couple of volunteer opportunities. You guys check that out as well. So kind of segueing on, I am also on the Youth Search Committee, and I just wanted to give you guys an update on the Lewis family. First of all, I want to say thank you for being your kind, authentic, welcoming selves. You guys killed it this week. The Lewis has felt so loved and just supported. Um, but we have recently found out we did offer him the job, but he has decided to take a role at a much smaller church in Dallas. It is a church that was decimated by COVID and now only has two staff members. His heart is for outreach, and this position is going to really, really work for him. It's a great fit for him. So what does that mean for us? We're going to regroup. The elders are getting together, and we're just going to keep searching because God has already done the work, and now we just need to sit back and be patient. So before Kirk goes, I'm going to go ahead and pray for that situation, and then we'll go back to worship. All right. Father God, first of all, I'll pray for the Lewises, Lord. You know, this is a big step of faith for them to take a position that is a little smaller, Lord. And I just pray that you would not only bless this church that they are going to, but also the community as well. And I pray for Trinity as we move forward, Lord, that we would stop shouldering the responsibility of finding this new youth pastor. And instead, we would give that to you. I pray for guidance. I pray for wisdom as we move forward. And I pray for our youth pastor where he or she is right now, Lord, that you would already be preparing them, preparing their family, and preparing us. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you, Stacey. Why don't we go ahead and stand as we continue worshiping this morning? Isaiah 54 reminds us that there's no weapon formed against us that's going to prosper, no voice that comes up against us that we won't prevail against. That's our heritage as the children of God. Whatever you're facing this morning, trust in him for victory. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's just continue worshiping and trusting in him.
power in the name of Jesus. There's no one like I gotta sing that. There's power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. Oh, I'm not backing down from any giant. this over your life this morning and I'm gonna see you victory I'm gonna see you victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see you victory I'm gonna see you victory for the battle belongs to you
You are faithful when we are not. God, when we sin, God, you love us. God, your grace is greater than our greatest sin. Father, thank you for being a good God, a good Father. 
Father, I pray that you would lead us into your presence this morning. Father, may we experience you in a new way today. Let us know your grace. Let us know your truth. Father, you are here in this place this morning. God, you are here with us. God, you want to meet with us. Father, would your spirit just continue to just move in every heart, every life. God, would you have your way. God, would you break down walls. God, bring freedom to those who are captive this morning. Bring healing to those who are hurting. Bring salvation to those who are lost. Father, you are near this morning, and we thank you. We thank you that you are not a God who is far away, that we have to holler at or get your attention. But God, you are near, you are right next to us. Father, continue to move, continue to speak this morning. In Jesus' name. our God 
He walks with us every step of the way, never alone. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. Yeah. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come with me in the space between all the things and see and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Sing it, I know. today no matter what we face he's with us there'll be another in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the sea should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me Count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Sing it again In the end of fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the water Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I count the joy come every Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count, I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Father, thank you for being with us Every moment, God, you deliver us from the fire God, even if you don't, Father, we still praise you God, we don't bow to the ways of this world. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys could be seated. Good morning. I'm Chuck Reeves. It's been a pleasure to worship with you this morning. And 
I'd like to continue that worship as uh, we join together in communion. For those of you that are with us uh, online, this would be a good time for you to gather some semblance of bread and juice so that uh, you can participate with us. Um, you know, it's quite common that when one of us leads communion at the time of uh, passing out the elements, the bread and the juice, um, we always come back to Paul's words uh, that he gave to us in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11. But before I read those, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we don't really see what he said before that and after that. And it's very powerful what he said. He was actually very unhappy with the people of that church and how they were handling communion. He, he thought they did not handle it well at all. Um, I'll read a few passages. Um, he says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. And then he later says, um, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the, the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Well, to me, that's, that's kind of a wake-up call. That's, that's telling me that we should not take this lightheartedly. This is a, a special sacrament. We're, I think we are called to look inside and examine our hearts and be sure that we are in a good place with the Lord. So put, that, put aside everything else that you might be thinking about, and let's focus on the, the body and the blood of Jesus and what that means for us. His body was broken for us. His blood was poured out for us. Um, ushers, if you will pass out the um, elements. And while they're doing that, if you would just take a moment and, and reflect and think about what this, what, what we're about to partake and, um, and what that means for you. Now, before I continue reading the words of Paul, just to remind you, we, we've got these all-in-one um, uh, bread and juice at the moment. So just be prepared that you just peel off the very top label to get to the little cracker, and then you peel off the next label to get to the, to the cup. Um, so Paul, in the midst of his talking to his people, he did say that this is what the Lord has to say about communion. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's peel back. And... Same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your body and your blood, and may we never take it for granted. We do this in remembrance of you, and we look forward to that day when we celebrate your, uh, in your presence, celebrate this again. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Kurt, for remembering and coming back up on stage. How's everybody doing this morning? My name is Matt Adams. I'm the associate pastor at Trinity. Michael is on vacation, and uh, so I'm filling in the next couple of weeks. Um, as we get started, if you could pull the house lights up just a little bit so I can see. Um, if you are an introvert, raise your hand. All right, that's a bad question to ask. Introverts don't like to have attention brought to them. If your hand shot up immediately, you are not an introvert. <laughs> if you think you are, you're like, oh, introvert, yeah, that's me. So let's try this another way. Everybody raise your hand. All right, if you're an extrovert, put your hand down. All right, there's all the introverts. <laughs> all right, so... Um, those of you who are introverts, what are some of the things that drive you crazy about us extroverts? Anybody got any? What drives you crazy? If you're married to one, just tell me what drives you crazy about your spouse. You can just stop never stop talking. Man, you weren't supposed to hit that right off on. <laughs> Oftentimes, we think about these words, introvert and extrovert, and, and they've become such a common part of, of our language and, and things that we use and ways that we describe people um, that some people use it to mean like introverts are shy and extroverts are outgoing. And it's really a, a, has a whole lot more uh, involved in it. And the introverts are actually focused inward into their own thoughts, and extroverts uh, focus outward on the world around them. It's kind of a perspective difference. Um, so you can see this, and it plays out most in team settings. When a team is meeting and an issue is on the table, the extroverts will just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, and talk until they come up with an idea, right? The introverts will actually think and quietly formulate an idea and then share it. And so what that tells you is that about 95% of what extroverts say, you can just set aside because we are thinking out loud. We have no idea what we're saying. We are just processing out loud so you can pretty much dismiss the things that we're saying. Um, it, it is interesting just the difference and, and if you're married to one or if you have children who are introverts and extroverts, um, I have learned over the process of the last several years um, that, that it is easy for us extroverts to really uh, wish that that introverts would speak up, speak their mind, would be a little more spontaneous, and extroverts, introverts, um, like Hannah said, are wishing that us extroverts would just shut up for a minute and just chill out. And I feel like that the passage we're going to look at this morning was written to extroverts. And we're in the middle of a series, uh, actually we just started a series um, called The Way of Wisdom, and it's a, a series in the book of James. And uh, this morning, we're going to look at uh, the back half of James chapter 1. So if you've got your Bible, you can flip over 
to James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. At the beginning of James, during that first part of that, that first chapter, he talks about trials and temptations. Michael talked last week about uh, how do we deal with, how do we handle, what is the process of trials and temptations? How do we um, receive that as believers? And in the back half of James, he tells us that how to respond to trials and temptations with wisdom. How to respond to those trials and temptations with wisdom. So take a look with me at the James 1, verse 19. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Those of you who are extroverts don't like reading that passage because slow to speak is very, very hard for us. And introverts want to memorize it and post it up on our mirror so that we can see it and remember to slow down so that they have a chance to process. So as we look at this section of James chapter 1, what we are going to see is, is that there is a way to respond to trials, temptations, difficulty, conflict in a way that's wise. Um, and in order to do that, I want to first kind of give you the uh, opposite of what the verse is, is laying out for us and kind of how do we usually respond to trials of life? How do we respond to trials of life just kind of out of our flesh? How do we respond um, out of just our weaknesses and our insecurities when we're not depending on God, when we're not depending on the Holy Spirit? This is the tendency that we have. And first of all, our first tendency is that we don't listen, right? We don't listen. Listening in our society in today's time is really a lost art form. Uh, while someone is speaking, I know I usually do this, I'm looking at them and I may be nodding, but in my mind I am formulating my own response or my own position. Uh, especially if I disagree with the person. As they begin to speak, and if I disagree with where they're coming from, I've already kind of stopped listening, and I begin to formulate my response or to begin to firm up my response and strengthen how I can come back to what I've already judged to be uh, an incorrect view or an incorrect response. Uh, when conflict arises, in our relationships, it's almost like our ears just simply stop functioning, right? And we just don't listen. We stop listening, we stop processing, and we are just thinking and ready with the information that we want to start spewing. So not only do we not listen, but we speak too much. We speak too much. Not listening well leads to speaking, speaking too much. Uh, we say things that we don't mean. We say things that we will later regret. Um, it's like the anger, the frustration, the conflict. It's like the dam is broken and the floodwaters just kind of run all over everybody that's around us and its destructive path as our words and our position because first of all we haven't listened and we're just spewing out our own thoughts and our own perspective which then leads to we become angry if we don't listen and we speak too much we become angry we become frustrated um it leads to anger, and anger is like this rot that just destroys everything that we've worked so hard to build, everything that God has been doing in our life. This anger, this frustration just begins to undo that. And in James, he kind of begins to unpack um, and flip-flop a little bit between kind of the negative uh, in the positive. And so as we pull out, what does this anger lead to? 
So if I'm not listening, I'm speaking too much, it leads to anger, what does that lead to? And in verse 20, he says, for a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. For a man's anger is not the pathway to righteousness. And what I can draw from that is anger, when we respond this way, it basically stunts our spiritual growth. And so anger leads to stunted spiritual growth. James has written this book to Jewish Christians. uh, And uh, these Jewish Christians are trying to understand what living with wisdom looks like. These Jews would have grown up living under the law and the sacrificial system. And we see throughout the Gospels that Jesus confronted their spiritual practices many times. And the legalism, the misinterpretation of God's intent. And uh, what he wanted them to see is that it isn't what you do, but who you are becoming. And as Jesus begins to confront this idea of this legalistic structure of if you do this and you do this and you sacrifice this and you purify this, then you'll be okay with God. And Jesus continually pushed it on that and said it's those things are important to do those things, but it's about the heart. And generation after generation of Jews passed down these requirements of the law, but most of them failed to see that God was concerned mostly with their hearts. Spiritual growth for us comes when we uh, trust Christ as Savior. Spiritual growth begins, that, that seed of spiritual growth when we trust Christ as Savior, when we trust His death on the cross and, and its p- payment for the penalty of our sins, and a belief that it satisfies God's need to punish that sin. That is kind of the the birthplace of spiritual growth. And that grace, our faith activates God's grace in our life. That faith, God's desire to move in, to extend grace to us, begins to grow. That grace gives us an eternity with God in heaven, but that same grace also helps us to grow spiritually. That same grace helps us to grow spiritually, and it helps us to experience a radical life change. It brings us joy. It gives us guidance in difficult times and supports us when we feel defeated. But anger short-circuits that spiritual growth. Anger short-circuits that spiritual growth. So God has something big that he wants to do in our lives. He wants to bring about spiritual transformation. And it starts with trusting in in Christ's death on the cross. And then as we submit to our relationship with him and the Holy Spirit's work in our life, we become transformed. But when we let relational conflict, trials, and temptations lead us down a wrong path, it's like the circuit gets broken. Anger short circuits that, and when anger roots itself, we stop growing spiritually, which results in the second thing that anger leads to, and that's prideful living. Prideful living. And prideful living is just simply seeing things through our own perspective. What are the struggles I'm going through? How does that affect me? How will that benefit me? I wish that you were more like me. Uh, All of the things that we so struggle with in life is, is not perceiving the entirety of life through our own lens. And, and, and so this stunted spiritual growth lives, leads to prideful living, which then also leads to a lack of self-awareness and that we see ourselves through tainted lens lenses. And, And you look at me and you see that I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I may be bitter, but I don't see that. I feel like I'm doing all right. I feel like maybe I'm strong and I'm standing up for my principles and I get around people and they're like, what's wrong with him? Um, He seems to have a chip on his shoulder. And we become uh, unaware of who we are at that time. And that leads to 
remaining in bondage. We continue to remain in bondage to the anger and therefore have trouble navigating through the trials and temptations. So this passage speaks to those things. And so as we begin to walk through the passage, we'll begin to see how should we respond? How should we respond differently? And when we do respond differently, what does that lead to? All right, and so how should we respond? Let's go back to James 1, verse 19. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. So the first thing that I need to do is listen well. I need to listen well. And that does not come naturally. It takes work. I have to be intentional when we face trials, temptations, or conflict in our relationships. It is important, it is critical to remember to slow down, take a breath, and listen. Listen involves walking into a conflict. This is, this is so hard. I almost didn't type this in my notes because it's so difficult to do. It involves walking into conflict with the willingness to learn something from the other person and a willingness to admit that we are wrong if that turns out to be the case. And so when I am experiencing conflict with somebody, I need to engage it to listen to them so that I can learn something from them and possibly admit that I am wrong. And that's where listening takes place. If I am not with that attitude, then I'm not really listening. I'm just hearing so I can prep my response. Listening well naturally flows into keeping quiet. Keeping quiet. Extroverts, keeping quiet. <laughs> I say that to myself all the time. Don't say anything, just listen. We can't listen if we're talking. And we need to deeply think before we speak. We need to think before we type a response on social media. We need to think before we respond. And we need to keep quiet and listen and remain calm. Remain calm. Everything within us wants to respond out of our own weaknesses, my weaknesses, my fears, my, my failures, my anger, my hate, my shame, all of those things are what I want to respond out of. I feel insecure, I feel threatened, and I want to respond out of that. But instead, I need to remain calm and I need to respond through God's grace. And I need to respond through God's grace. God's grace that is trying and attempting to transform me into something different. And that as we allow God's spirit to control us, we can remain calm, keep quiet, and listen as well. So if I respond the way God wants me to, then I'm going to listen well, I'm going to keep quiet, I'm going to remain calm. It's going to lead to a couple of different things. Excuse me, which leads to, first of all, it leads to radical life change. It leads to radical life change. For, in verse 20, he says, For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. He's telling us that something does lead to the righteousness of God. And responding out of weakness, responding out of frustration, interacting with trials and temptations um, on your own, out of the flesh, is not the way to achieve the righteousness of God. What he's saying is, is that, um, that anger short circuits that, but the Spirit's, God's Spirit working in our lives brings about radical transformation that God is doing in us and through us. And that that trans transformation then unpacks itself in three different ways in our life. First of all, it results in humble living. Whenever we live out of the flesh, we, um, 
we have prideful living. But whenever we allow God's spirit to, to bring radical change in our life, we begin to experience humble living. And in, in verse 21, in humility, receive the word implanted. In humility, we have the ability to see things through people's eyes. Imagine that, that, that empathy, that ability to interact in a situation and not roll in with, you know, my defense is up and the gun's ready to go, but instead to roll in and to see it through their eyes and to, to imagine how they're experiencing life. When I'm experiencing conflict with someone, I desperately need to have empathy and I need to be humble as I am interacting with that. And that the ability to, to experience humility comes from God's word. It comes from his truth. It comes from his spirit working and transforming my life. That humble living, radical life change leads to a deeper self-awareness. In verse 22, he continues on. And he says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not just hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But anyone who has looked intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. This, this image of looking into a mirror and forgetting what we look like, it's really fascinating. Um, I don't know if you have ever seen a picture that you're in and been like, where am I? And somebody else has to point them, point them out. You, you don't forget what you look like. I actually saw a movie one time that was very fascinating where a guy couldn't recognize his own face. Um, but we just don't. Like, like twins, some of you guys in this room may be twins identical twins you probably look at a picture and you probably don't look at it and go well, which one's me you probably know because we know what we look like are there any twins in the room no twins in the room okay good you could have proven me wrong there maybe I didn't know what I was talking about but this idea of looking in the mirror so I am super guilty I don't look in the mirror very often um, I, there's, I don't know if I don't really super duper care what I look like or what people think about me and drives Gwen crazy. And so I'll get out of bed. I've been, you know, sleeping or taking a nap. And then I get up and I go to the grocery store and my hair's like all messed up. And, and I show up and she's like, did you really go to the store like that? And I'm like, like what? And I look in the mirror. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, you got to tell me, don't let me leave like that. And she's like, look at yourself, you know. That's what mirrors do. Mirrors reflect back to us who we are. The mirror doesn't lie, unless you have one of those funky, like, weird mirrors from, um, you know, the circus or whatever. That, But mirrors don't lie. When you look in it, it shows you what you really look like. And that's what he is saying is that God, God's word helps us to see ourselves as we really are. It helps us to see ourselves. We're able to see our strengths. We're able to see our weaknesses. And the truth is, is none of us are perfect. And yet oftentimes we live uh, with shame of our own perfection. None of us are perfect. We're, you know, we extend grace to people around us all the time. Oh, that's okay if you made a mistake. But if I make a mistake, I don't let myself off the hook ever. And we live with that shame but the, the reality is if I embrace God's truth, if I embrace God's grace, if I live out of it, then the truth is that he will begin to bless me. And he says that this person will be blessed in what he does. The person that truly understands who they are, the true person that allows God's word to be a reflection on who they are and, and doing a couple of different things accepting who we are, not hiding it, not defending it, not being shameful or angry or frustrated, but then also clearly seeing it and allowing God to transform us into what he wants us to be. And then we become blessed 
with freedom. We become blessed with freedom. Scripture talks about all kinds of different things and relates it to bondage, like being in prison or being bound. And that there's so many things in life. We become bound to, to addictions. We become bound to debt. We become bound to all different kinds of things. In the, and at the base of sin is bondage. At the base of anger and shame and hatred and fear. And when we live life out of these things, it becomes like a prison. And you know what that feels like. And you, you, you feel like you can't breathe sometimes because there's so many things that you feel like are pressing in on you. And he's saying that Scripture um, is the, gives us the ability to be freed from that, to experience the blessing of freedom. Um, it's really sad that, that, that Scripture is oftentimes seen by the world, uh, by different people. I have conversations, and it, it's seen as just a restrictive set of rules that limits our freedom. And you'll hear people say that, you know, Christianity and the Bible, it's so restrictive, and, and it takes away your freedom. And, 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 and really, it was given to us as a guide which leads us and breaks the chains of anger, hate, fear, shame, which leads to freedom. It's a really powerful, powerful thing in our lives to be experienced this freedom from bondage. And so as I take James's uh, encouragement in this passage, his, his encouragement is for us to slow down, be calm, and to get out of God's way for what he's trying to do in our lives. To get out of the way. I oftentimes am the primary reason why God is not transforming me into everything that he wants me to be. I usually blame other things. Like, life is hard here, this is difficult, this unforeseen circumstance happened, you know, COVID, lost my job, you know, we have all kinds of things. We go, well, I'm just not really in a good place right now because of all this external stuff. And, and the, the reality is, is that I am most responsible for my own spiritual life and my own spiritual growth. And he's saying, slow down. Just listen, listen well, and don't become angry. Don't become fearful, and don't let those things rule you. And, and in summary, he says, anger leads to inward living. If you think about this whole extrovert, introvert thing, um, it, it's kind of an interesting analogy in that, that spiritually, he's, he's drawing a negative that, that Inward living is a negative thing. We know that an introverted personality is not a negative thing. Um, it's actually very beneficial for those of us who are extroverts to have a good introvert around us to keep us in check. But in this situation, he's saying anger le leads to, in a sense, introverted spirituality. Inward living, it leads to um, self-centeredness. It leads to uh, unclarity in who we are and, and self-awareness. But walking with Christ leads to transformation. Walking with Christ leads with, to transformation. I, sometimes I think about where would I be if, if I had not made a decision and continue to make a decision consistently to walk with Jesus. Uh, I came to know Christ when I was about six uh, um, at a backyard Bible club that my church was doing. I grew up going to church, and uh, this lady gave a gospel presentation, and she asked, uh, would anybody like to trust Christ as Savior? And I knew I had heard it at church, and my parents had been talking to me about it, and I was an extrovert, and so my hand shot up really fast, and, and um, she was like, well, good, because you're a problem, so maybe you'll change. Um, <laughs> No. And so I can remember we went around behind a couch that was in the living room where she had been sharing the gospel. And we knelt down and she 
just briefly explain the gospel of Jesus' death on the cross, um, his, his uh, burial and resurrection, and, and that God was satisfied with that. And if I trusted in Christ's death, that I could uh, receive forgiveness and become a child of God. And I did that right there. And, and then uh, several years later, I was baptized. And then my church hired a youth pastor when I was in eighth grade. And I began to, to get discipled and, and learn what it meant to study God's word and how to share my faith and how to lead groups. And then I got involved in Campus Crusade and, and did campus ministry and went to seminary and went to a church before we ended up here. And my whole journey has been just leading to the next step of walking and following in what God wanted for me. But I easily can look at any point and know that there's been temptations, there's been struggles, and I've been one decision away from just derailing God's plan for my life. But walking with God leads to transformation. And that when we look at someone who seems like they're a spiritual giant, and you're looking over here and you're going, man, they're so mature. It's because they have just consistently made the decision to continue to walk with him. And that transformation just happens bit by bit by bit. And that transformation then leads to outward living. Transformation leads to outward living. It's interesting. He throws this very bizarre verse at the end that seemed like it doesn't really fit. But he says in, in verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God and, and uh, of our God and Father is this, to vi visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. It's just simply he is saying when transformation happens, you begin to live outwardly. You begin to see the world through other people's eyes. You begin to engage those who are needy. You begin to serve those who have uh, needs. And that, that in the midst of all of that, trusting and staying close to Jesus so that we don't find ourselves getting derailed. Uh, anger leads to inward living. Walking with Christ leads to transformation. And transformation leads to outward living. So this morning, as, a, as I close, I just want to challenge you to think about where are you in that process of transformation? What is the obstacles or the hurdles that have stood in your way? Um, life has not been easy. And, and I'm right there with you that, that it, is, it has been a tough year. Um, for some, it has been uh, a tough decade. And, and, and God wants to meet you in the middle of that. He wants to walk with you. He wants to empower you. And he wants to transform you from the inside out so that you have the ability to respond to those things differently and in a healthy way and serve those who are needy. Uh, let me pray for us. Uh, God, this morning, uh, just taking James's words to heart, um, we understand nobody has to convince us that we live our lives uh, primarily focused on ourselves. Uh, we spend all morning um, getting ready to leave the house, eating, um, you know, primping, doing whatever we have to do to make sure that we are presentable and ready for the world. Um, everything about our life tends to focus on our security, our happiness, our uh, what is it that we are getting out of, of life, and it is difficult to break free from that. Um, God, life is tough, and it throws us curveballs all the time. In the midst of that, help us to slow down, to listen, and to remain calm. In the midst of that, we discover your spirit. We discover peace. And you have a place to begin or continue to transform our hearts. 
and our lives. And we just pray these things in your name. Amen. So thank you for coming this morning. I'm going to encourage the uh, uh, the prayer team. We're going to have some members of the prayer team up front. And so if, if you have some things this morning that you would like some prayer on, uh, please come up and, and uh, let the prayer team take some time uh, to pray for you uh, through those things. Again, if you are visiting, please stop by our welcome booth in the back. And uh, other than that, thank you for coming, and we will see you next Sunday.